You hear a lot nowadays about franchise fatigue. The idea that a film or a television franchise has lost popularity because people have become fatigued with the franchise. That franchise has overall saturated the market and thus people have become weary of that franchise. Well, I don't believe that's necessarily true. That the reason why some franchises may decrease in popularity is more complicated than simply getting sick of too many releases from that franchise. In fact, I would say it has a lot more to do with the decrease in quality of the projects of that franchise being released uh, than it does with the number of projects being released. To examine this concept, I'm going to be looking at three franchises in particular. Star Trek, Star Wars, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which have all been accused at various points in time of suffering from franchise fatigue. So this is the myth of franchise fatigue and why it's dangerous. Part 1. Franchise Fatigue and Star Trek. I would like to examine the concept of franchise fatigue on how it relates to my personal favorite film slash television franchise, Star Trek. Star Trek started with the original series in the 60s, expanded to a movie series in the 80s, and then expanded with multiple spin-offs in the 90s, including The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. Following the end of Voyager in the early 2000s, a successor series was released, Star Trek Enterprise, as well as the Next Generation-themed filmed Star Trek Nemesis, which was released in 2002. Both were considered to be failures, as Star Trek Enterprise was cancelled after its fourth season when it was tradition for Star Trek shows to run for seven seasons and Nemesis flopped at the box office which led to more planned Star Trek films being cancelled and Enterprise was not followed up by another Star Trek show. So Star Trek appeared to be dead or at least wasn't releasing any new material for the first time since 1979. That's until 2009, only four years after Enterprise was cancelled, with the return of J.J. Abrams' soft reboot, a film simply called Star Trek. After being a huge success, this was followed up by Star Trek Into Darkness in 2012 and Star Trek Beyond in 2016. But it wasn't until 2017 that Star Trek returned to making TV shows with the premiere of Star Trek Discovery a full 12 years after Enterprise went off the air. Discovery was then followed by further Star Trek spinoffs including Picard, Lower Decks, Prodigy and the direct spinoff to Discovery Strange New Worlds. And as of the making of this video, another spinoff, Starfleet Academy, is planned to replace Discovery, which will finish its run this year. As well as there are plans for a straight to streaming movie, Section 31. Now, there are several points I would like to focus on that I believe are relevant to the discussion. Most of all is the 12 year gap that occurred in between the ending of Star Trek Enterprise and the premiere of Star Trek Discovery. Now, it's true that three Star Trek movies were released during this time, but they were reboots that were taking place in another timeline, often referred to as the Kelvin timeline, and thus were a bit of a departure from the previous Star Trek projects. And the films were also more far and in between. Star Trek shows weren't being released on a regular basis during this time like they were before and after this time. Many would uh, explain this gap as being uh, the result of franchise fatigue. Not just fans, but also critics, analysts, and even those involved in running the franchise. Rick Berman, the producer responsible for running Star Trek since Roddenberry's death in 1991 up to the cancellation of Enterprise in 2005, blamed franchise fatigue for Enterprise's failure. He apparently didn't want to do another Star Trek series um, following the end of uh, Voyager, saying um, Star Trek was wearing out its welcome and needed a break. But the studio was determined to do one with or without him, so he elected to be involved and along with Brennan Brega created Star Trek Enterprise. 
After Enterprise's cancellation, Berman blamed it on franchise fatigue, stating that people were just being oversaturated with too much Star Trek. I don't agree. First of all, the reason for Enterprise's cancellation by many accounts was a political reason within UPN, the network it was airing on. Those at the studio who supported Star Trek had left and were being replaced by those that wanted to take the network in a different direction. Also, this was around the time that Viacom and CBS split, which also had an effect on Star Trek. By all accounts, Enterprise had increased its ratings and cri uh, critical and fan response with Season 3 and Season 4, and was in fact doing better than before uh, in its fourth season when it was cancelled. Uh, this would seem to contradict the conclusion that it was cancelled due to franchise fatigue. However, there is no doubt that the Star Trek franchise had lost popularity since the ending of Voyager and hadn't been as popular as it was since its heyday when the Next Generation and Deep Space Nine were airing side by side. However, to blame this on audiences becoming tired with too much Star Trek is inaccurate. I believe it's more correct to say that audiences had become tired of Star Trek of lesser quality. Deep Space Nine in its final season was quite popular and well received by fans. Um, although its ratings at the time for the final season of Deep Space Nine were l the lowest that the show has ever been, it was still higher than Voyager's rating at its highest. Moreover, the final seasons of Deep Space Nine had received a lot of praise and have been acquiring new fans ever since it hit streaming services as its serialized storytelling lends itself more to the streaming format. However, Voyager, on the other hand, did not receive as much praise after the fact and the final seasons of Voyager does have its defenders. It is overall seen as bland and not something that stands out as much as Deep Space Nine or The Next Generation. This was due to the studios constantly fighting against a sense of continuity that would have taken advantage of the show's premise to build characters and world building where the pushback against that was so strong and arguably became more episodic than even The Next Generation was, which was contrary to to the show's premise. This also led to bland storytelling that was too derivative of The Next Generation, leading many to believe it was a lesser version of The Next Generation. It also ignored its core principal cast in its final seasons and underwrote them all in favor of propping up the characters of The Doctor and Seven of Nine. In other words, it decreased in quality. Immediately following Voyager was Star Trek Enterprise, which at first was just called Enterprise in a misguided attempt to attract more viewers to the show who were not Star Trek fans. In fact, many attempts were made with Enterprise to try to make it appeal to general audiences, such as having the theme song be a contemporary soft rock song rather than the typical orchestral theme that opens the Star Trek show, playing up the sexuality in obvious and gratuitous ways such as the decontamination scenes which saw the main characters strip to their underwear and spread a gel that made their hot bodies shiny all over each other. Um, to having Archer trying to act like a tough guy by having him say things like I'm trying hard not to knock you on your ass. All these attempts felt insincere and were in contrast to the rest of the show's more bland tone and thus stuck out as obvious and contrived attempts to appeal to mass audiences. Further, the first several seasons strayed from the usual Star Trek stories in favor of more slice-of-life stories in a hard science fiction fashion, a style that does not at all fit in Star Trek series. And yet, somehow Enterprise managed to have episodes that were bland versions of other Star Trek episodes that already existed, as some of the episodes could be described as copy-and-paste versions of previous Star Trek episodes, but far less interesting. On top of that, Enterprise suffered from the same problem that Voyager did in its final two seasons of having a cast of bland and uninteresting characters, although it was worse in the case of Enterprise as the characters were created as bland, particularly the supporting characters who saw little development or relevance throughout the course of the show. 
Now, it is true that Enterprise had improved in its third and fourth seasons once the show creators Rick Berman and Brenna Braga started to step back from the show, with show running duties being given to Manny Cotto in the fourth season. Brennan Brega himself even once said that Manny Cotto should have been the showrunner of Enterprise from the very beginning as he understood what a Star Trek prequel should be. And indeed, the ratings and critical reception of season 3 and 4 did increase, but were still never at the level of Voyager, which in turn was never at the stage of Deep Space Nine or The Next Generation. So to say the franchise was in decline was in fact accurate. Then there was the fourth uh, Next Generation film, Star Trek Nemesis, that was released in 2002 while Enterprise was airing. Um, This film was a flop that barely made back its budget. But again, this was due to many factors other than franchise fatigue. The script was written by John Logan, a professional script writer who worked on such films uh, as Gladiator and was a self-proclaimed Star Trek fan. While this may sound like a good idea, it lacked a seasoned and experience from writing... um, from writers with experience from writing on The Next Generation. However, the bigger issue was by far the director. As LeVar Burton, who played a Geordi LaForge and had directed many episodes previous, um, from previous Star Trek series, was pushing to direct the next Star Trek film. Something that Star Trek producer Rick Berman supported, but was overruled by the studio. Nicholas Meyer, who had directed two of the most popular Star Trek movies, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, was also considered to direct Nemesis, but they couldn't get him to come on board because the way he works is by having final control over the script and John Logan had it in his contract that only he could have final control of the script and thus Meyer's decline to take up directing duty which is yet another reason why bringing Logan on board to write the script was a mistake. So, the studio ended up pushing uh, Stuart Bard on them as director against Rick Berman's wishes, as Paramount had made a deal with Bard to work on several films as an uncredited editor if they allowed him to direct the next Star Trek film. Bard admittedly knew nothing about Star Trek and uh, would often get basic details about the next generation wrong. Many viewed him as a hired gun whose heart wasn't in the project and was mainly doing it as just another job. The studio interference was also a problem as, like Enterprise, they tried too hard to appeal to mass audiences, including indulging Patrick Stewart's desire to have a Jeep chase scene in the film, which felt completely irrelevant and unnecessary to the story, and overall... They played up the violent and action aspects of the film, which was not typical of Star Trek films. They uh, included uh, a couple of telepathic rape scenes that the majority of audiences viewed as being in bad taste. But probably worst of all was Paramount's bad decision to release this film in a very crowded Christmas season where huge blockbusters such as the second Lord of the Rings film, the second Harry Harry Potter film and the third Matrix movie were being released, which completely overshadowed Nemesis. So, in other words, the Star Trek franchise dwindled and went away for seven years on the big screen and 12 years on the small screen due to lesser quality projects and not franchise fatigue. I would passionately argue that had the next Star Trek show after Voyager been given to more interested and passionate showrunners like Manny Cotto or Ronald D. Moore or Michael Piller or Ira Stephen Bear rather than Berman and Braga, the very two creators responsible for making the final seasons of Voyager bland and who by their own admissions were not that interested in the project, then the next Star Trek show show would have been a success and not a failure. 
Same goes for the fourth uh, Next Generation movie. Had they given the writing duties to a seasoned Star Trek writer like Pillar or Ronald D. Moore, and more importantly, giving directing duties to someone who understood and cared about Star Trek like Burton or Myers, then the film would have succeeded. And with both Enterprise and Nemesis, the studio needed to step back and stop interfering by trying to sex it up or make it more appealing to general audiences. Such efforts did not attract more audiences and only resulted in alienating the audiences that they already had. Had these things been done, I don't think Enterprise would have been cancelled, and Nemesis wouldn't have flopped, and their plan to create more Star Trek films that would bring in characters from the next generation Deep Space Nine and Voyager would have went forward. So in other words, no one would be talking about franchise fatigue because there wouldn't have been a break in the Star Trek franchise, meaning franchise fatigue is a myth. It's not why the Star Trek franchise failed. It was clearly because of bad decisions made on the creators and studios part. And Rick Berman blaming franchise fatigue on Star Trek's temporary death was just a way for him to deflect from the blame he rightfully deserved for bringing on that death. As the term franchise fatigue suggests the fan base had grown tired of the franchise when in fact it was the creators who had grown tired as Berman and Brega admitted their desire wasn't there to make more Star Trek. So had they stepped aside for fresher and newer voices, the audiences would have been just as engaged with the franchise as ever. That's why I find this talk about franchise fatigue and the modern Star Trek era misguided and dangerous. As I've read many articles warning of franchise fatigue as Star Trek has too many shows going on at the same time. As uh, at its peak, there were five shows, Discovery, Picard, Lower Decks, Prodigy and Strange New Worlds. However, Picard has come to an end, and Discovery will shortly come to an end, which only leaves Strange New Worlds as the only live-action Star Trek show that will remain, with Lower Decks and Prodigy, two animated shows, also remaining. Although another planned show, Starfleet Academy, is planned to replace Discovery, it would be just those two live action shows and two animated shows along with the occasional streaming movie. Many warn that to add any more shows would be risking franchise fatigue. In fact, some warn by having just by having those four shows by themselves is risking franchise fatigue, but I could not disagree more with that. While these shows aren't for everyone, they are diverse and covering different niches, as you have an old-style episodic Star Trek show updated for modern audiences, an adult animated comedy in the vein of Rick and Morty and The Simpsons, but for Star Trek fans, and an animated kids show aimed at younger audiences, um, and a new teen drama aimed at young adults. While the reception of Starfleet Academy remains to be seen, the Strange New Worlds and Lower Decks have acquired large followings, becoming quite popular and arguably the two most successful Trek shows in the modern era. And Prodigy, while not as popular, has a fan base so devoted that they rallied to bring the show back when Paramount Plus removed it from its service and has found new audiences and popularity on its new home of Netflix. So... Some warn that shows like The Proposed Legacy, a, a successor to Season 3 of Picard, which many fans and creatives involved with the show are pushing for, shouldn't be greenlit because it would risk franchise fatigue. And those warnings should very much be ignored, because franchise fatigue isn't a thing. As long as they continue to create projects uh, that people like, people will watch it. And, the se and uh, Secret Hideout has shown an ability to adapt 
to what the fan base wants. By changing the tone and setting of Discovery, which many had complained about, and greenlighting shows like Strange New Worlds, which fans were clamoring for. And the cancellation of Discovery, I think, is also an indicator of the creators being aware of the pulse of their fan base, as that show has waned in popularity and has not been as popular or well received as Strange New Worlds and Lower Decks. So as long as they continue to do that, the Star Trek franchise will be fine, and any warning of franchise fatigue should be ignored as it's not actually a thing. Part 2. Franchise Fatigue and Star Wars Star Wars, despite also having the word star in its title, is a totally different situation than Star Trek. Uh, not just overall, but also when uh, specifically looking at franchise fatigue. As Star Wars has no doubt dwindled in popularity in recent years, uh, something that many people attribute to franchise fatigue. Star Wars is a different franchise than Star Trek, as Star Trek started its life as a TV show, and even though there were 13 movies made, Star Trek mostly existed on TV, being designed as an ongoing and continuous series that uh, now has acquired 11 shows with uh, collectively nearly a thousand episodes in total. Whereas Star Wars began its uh, life as one film that was so popular it acquired two sequels. And for over a decade, the film trilogy of uh, was all that Star Wars was. Eventually, another film trilogy was created, set before the events of the first trilogy, and although up until Disney bought Star Wars in 2012, there were other Star Wars projects such as the Clone Wars uh, animated series and a vast collection of novels and comic books known as the Star Wars Expanded Universe. For most mainstream audiences, Star Wars consisted of six movies. Uh, these two trilogies were each self-contained and told one story with a beginning, middle, and end, which as stated is different than a franchise like Star Trek that was designed as an ongoing series with many nooks and crannies in that universe to explore. Now, the existence of the Expanded Universe and uh, Clone Wars series did indicate that fans of this franchise were um, interested in exploring the universe more and thought it should go beyond simply six movies. However, those could be described as niche audiences, and to the mainstream audiences, Star Wars was always an event series. That is, it consisted of three movies that were released three years apart each, and then 16 years later, there was another trilogy with each film being released three years apart. In other words, the release of each Star Wars film was few and far between, so when Disney purchased Star Wars with the plan to release a film every year, plus a series of um, TV shows released on Disney+, Plus, this completely changed the nature of the Star Wars franchise. Now, their plan to release a film every year um, came to a halt, in 2019 after the release of five films. This was mostly due to the commercial failure of Solo, A Star Wars Story in 2018, which was considered the first Star Wars movie to flop. And although the following movie, The Rise of Skywalker, was a commercial success by any metric, it still failed to make nearly as much money as its immediate predecessors, The Force Awakens, Rogue One, and The Last Jedi. In fact, even though Rise of Skywalker was still considered a success, compared to other Star Wars films, it was one of the lowest grossing Star Wars films released. So, with one film flopping and the other under underperforming, the call was made to halt Star Wars movies. And at the time this video uh, was made, even though there are several Star Wars films planned, there has of yet to be another release since The Rise of Skywalker nearly five years ago. Disney seemed to instead invest in streaming series for Disney Plus for Star Wars. 
As in 2019, The Mandalorian was a huge success. In fact, several planned movies, including a Boba Fett movie and an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie, were made into a Disney Plus series instead. And even though at first it seemed audiences preferred a a streaming series, as The Mandalorian Seasons 1 and 2 were a success, and the final season of The Clone Wars was received well. Even the popularity of streaming shows started to uh, diminish with each release, as The Book of Boba Fett was mostly panned by fans and critics alike. The Bad Batch was met with middling reception, as was Obi-Wan Kenobi series, the Ahsoka series, and even Season 3 of The Mandalorian wasn't near nearly as popular or well-liked as the first two were. So, there is a perception that Star Wars streaming shows keep diminishing in popularity and quality. So I believe the notion of franchise fatigue as it relates to Star Wars is a bit more complex than it was with Star Trek. As part of the theory of franchise fatigue is that it's due to over- saturating and I think this applies differently to Star Wars than it does to Star Trek because the constant release of movies and shows is transforming the franchise into something different than what it was. Part of the reason each Star Wars film was such a huge event and huge money maker was partly due to the fact that they were so few and far between. Therefore, if you saturate the market with far more movies and shows, one can expect diminishing returns as for one, it changes the nature of the franchise and as for two, it spreads out the viewership over many projects. However, this isn't necessarily a bad thing in my eyes as it just takes Star Wars down from a huge juggernaut to still a hit series. Even after its diminished returns, it still makes more money and has more popularity than most film and television franchises. So I would say it's inaccurate to describe this phenomenon as franchise fatigue, but rather the natural conclusion of changing the nature of the franchise. So. Let's examine Solo A Star Wars Story, the only Star Wars film to flop, and arguably the main reason why the studios decided to pause releasing Star Wars films, thus breaking their plan to release a new Star Wars film every year. This film was released six months after the release of The Last Jedi, making it the shortest time span in between films re- in between film releases. As I mentioned earlier, the normal time in between Star Wars movies was three years. When Disney started releasing Star Wars films, it was one year between films, but six months was by far the shortest time frame. In addition, The Last Jedi's reception was mixed at best, with there being a huge backlash with Star Wars fans not liking the film, which may have affected the reception of Solo. Also, Audiences just didn't seem excited for a Han Solo origin story. The previous Disney films had been part of the sequel trilogy, which fans were really excited about, uh, and Rogue One, which was a new take on Star Wars as it portrayed it as a war story similar to um, that of movies about the Vietnam War. But the reception of Solo was very lukewarm, even from those who did like The Last Jedi. I recall the phrase, no one asked for a Han Solo origin story, being used a lot by critics and commentators before its release. And after its release, it received mixed reviews at best, with many fans regarding it as mediocre. So yes, the fact that Disney released it too close to the other films may have affected its performance. However, I would say the mixed reception of The Last Jedi and people's lack of enthusiasm with uh, the premise combined with its lukewarm reception once it was released were chief reasons for its failure and not franchise fatigue. Now, as for Disney Plus series, with uh, which enthusiasm for these projects has diminished over time, I believe are a result of the shows becoming more niche and less appealing to mainstream audiences. While the first two seasons of The Mandalorian were a huge hit, The Book of Boba Fett was poorly received by critics and fans, many calling the show 
lesser quality. However, shows like Ahsoka, The Bad Batch, Andor, and The Mandalorian Season 3 were fairly well received, uh, but achieved lesser ratings, and I believe this was due to these shows becoming more niche rather than franchise fatigue. In the case of Andor, it was very well received by critics and many fans, as they considered it a triumph. However, ratings-wise, it didn't do very well, and I would say that was mainly due to it being very different in tone from anything previously released in Star Wars, as it took a more serious and dire tone that was much more aimed at adults and didn't prominently feature any of the fantasy elements more commonly associated with Star Wars in order to focus on a story that was more closely resembled modern-day conflicts and morally gray complexities that come with it. The Bad Batch was a direct spinoff of the Clone Wars final season and thus would be alienating to general audiences who hadn't seen the Clone Wars. And likewise, Ahsoka was a direct continuation of Star Wars Rebels, whose title character was introduced in the Clone Wars, making this show alienating to those who hadn't seen the animated shows. In fact, that was the main complaint critics seemed to make of Ahsoka, that it was har harder to follow or get interested in if you hadn't seen the Clone Wars or Rebels. Even The Mandalorian Season 3 explored more of the backstory and lore established in the Clone Wars and many other Star Wars shows, thus alienating audiences who hadn't seen them. Now, many fans like myself were excited about this as it explored the universe of Star Wars and did a better job of world building and making the universe feel tangible. It did have the effect of driving the franchise to be more niche, which the natural result of that would be to lose popularity. This had a lot more to do with why the franchise dwindled in popularity rather than franchise fatigue, as we see that even after Star Wars took a five year break from films, this did not seem to help interest in the franchise, as indeed the main issue people seem to have with the Obi-Wan Kenobi series was that it should have been a film, as there wasn't enough material to sustain a series. And thus, other factors are definitely more to blame for Star Wars' decline other than franchise fatigue. Part 3. The MCU and Franchise Fatigue so, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is probably the franchise most commonly associated with the term franchise fatigue, at least presently. It used to be when you released the movie set in the MCU, it would be a guaranteed blockbuster hit, and the top grossing movies of the year would typically include several MCU films. That, however, has changed in recent years, as in the past several years, some MCU movies did not do so well at the box office and were no longer surefire hits. And the last year saw not one, but two flops, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, and The Marvels. The MCU has also had several Disney Plus series that were poorly received by critics and audiences, including She-Hulk and Secret Invasion. Both were seen as failures. So, the most common cause critics and analysts blame for the decline in the MCU's franchise fatigue. And the reasoning for this tends to be that after Phase 3 of the MCU ended in 2019, the MCU started releasing 3-4 to four movies a year combined with 3-4 to four series on Disney Plus a year, which was releasing projects at a much faster rate than the MCU had done before. Many critics warn that they were oversaturating the market with too many superhero projects and audiences are becoming fatigued by it. And that's what they point to uh, as the major difference in Phase 4 and 5, which movies and series aren't performing as well as they did in earlier phases. However, I would point to other things that set Phase 4 and 5 apart from the earlier phases. The most obvious change is that at the end of Phase 3, uh, it resolved many of the story arcs of the MCU as well as seeing a departure of two of the most popular main characters, 
Iron Man, and Captain America. So Phase 4 had to basically start over again, even though some of the characters carried on from previous phases. They had to switch focus to some of the new characters like Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, both of whom were introduced in Phase 3. However, what I think was the bigger issue... Uh, than having too many projects is how they branched out with too many new and different characters. Phase 4 saw the introduction of Shang-Chi, the Eternals, a group of 10 new characters, Moon Knight, Miss Marvel, She-Hulk, Echo, and a whole bunch of new supporting characters while maintaining a lot of the old characters. So in my opinion, the issue with the MCU isn't too many projects, that causes fatigue. Rather, it's that they splintered the story off into too many different directions and tried new characters that failed to connect with fans and audiences. Also, there's a problem with the MCU having too many projects, but it isn't that it saturates the market or makes fans fatigue, but rather that it stretches its creative team too thin. Kevin Feige, who runs Marvel Studios, typically oversaw every MCU project to make sure things were running smoothly and to check quality control. And many fans and critics believed he was very good at this job and account for it being one of the main reasons the MCU has succeeded so well. However, starting in Phase 4, the MCU had too many projects for Feige to keep up with, or at least to do very well. In addition, the visual effects department was also having a hard time keeping up with, uh, which led to many subpar effects in projects like She-Hulk, whose main character was dependent on visual effects, and the visual effects heavy film Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. And the reason why audiences lost interest isn't necessarily too many projects, it's too many subpar projects. And because the MCU was releasing too many projects, that takes the stories off in too many directions and makes it harder to be more consistent with quality control that results in more subpar projects, and that's what's turning fans off. Also, there's something to be said about films being too derivative and formulaic, where it feels like each movie is repeating the same formula of earlier movies. This was actually a problem in Phase 1 and 2, as Marvel became infamous for repeating plot points such as having the superhero have to fight the villain in a final battle of the film and the villain is just another version of the hero having the same powers. Now as I mentioned earlier phases did this as well so this is nothing new for phase 4 and 5 but it could be a cumulative effect that the more they repeat these beats the more tiresome they become. This requires the MCU to innovate and come up with new and creative things which they have managed to do in projects like Loki, Moon Knight, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness and Spider-Man No Way Home. All projects that were seen as successful. However still wouldn't call these uh, effects franchise fatigue but had the projects been better, more original, and more quality control had been done, then there would be no fatigue. In fact, this ties in to the greater idea of superhero fatigue. As many claim it's not just Marvel that's facing fatigue, but the entire superhero genre. And I still strongly disagree with this. People aren't tired of too many superhero movies. They're tired of too many subpar superhero movies. There were many superhero movies, such as um, most of the films released in the DC Universe, which were seen as bland and subpar and underperformed at the box office at the same time the MCU movies were at the height of its popularity. Superhero fatigue didn't just suddenly come on all of a sudden as people were tired of other superhero movies while Marvel was still successful. It's just that the MCU is not being as effective as it used to be and thus the result is a great number of subpar superhero movies and not just a greater number of superhero movies overall. Now, some may argue that the lack of quality I described that resulted from too many projects is a form of franchise fatigue, but I would argue against that, as the term franchise fatigue seems to 
put the emphasis on it being about audiences. That audiences simply get tired of too many projects in a franchise or a genre. But the emphasis should be put on the studios that need to make sure their projects that they release are of quality. Because... If they don't, they'll just lose audiences. And to me, that's a different phenomenon than franchise fatigue. Franchise fatigue is a myth. So, in this video, I mainly looked at three franchises. Star Trek, Star Wars, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But that's mainly because these are all franchises I'm familiar with, and the term franchise fatigue has been used repeatedly to describe these franchises. However, what I said about franchise fatigue, I believe, applies to all film and TV franchises. And while it's true that franchises that release works that are too derivative of earlier works or too blunt, land or otherwise lacking quality can get audiences to lose interest in a franchise, I wouldn't describe this as franchise fatigue as it's more about audiences will lose interest in a film or TV show if it's of poor quality. And this remains true of all film and TV shows, not just those belonging to a franchise. If a cop show is too derivative of other cop shows, it will likely not be received well even if it's a standalone show not part of a franchise. Likewise, if a film has poor quality visual effects or a poor script, it won't be well received regardless of whether or not it's a franchise. So the moral is that franchises should not shy away from quote unquote saturating the market or releasing too many projects as long as they can maintain quality control in those projects because that's what matters more and can turn audiences off. Quality, not quantity. As it doesn't matter how many projects they release as long as they are all of high quality. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave a thumbs up. Uh, check out my channel as I cover many other videos on some of the topics that I covered in this video. In particular, Star Trek. I have covered... Uh, a lot of episodes and a lot of different commentary videos and top tens on Star Trek. I'm currently going through every episode of Star Trek. At the moment, I'm in the fourth season of Star Trek The Next Generation. So if you are a Star Trek fan, I would recommend checking that out. However, I do do videos on many other shows and films as well. Uh, so be sure to check that out. And be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks so much for watching.